in my judgment, the only thing we're going to take with us when we leave this life is the humanity we've expressed to others, the way we've applied humanity to our business, the way we've made mankind our business. This is the thing that will go with us as we leave this life. Well, um, my name is Paul Andrus, and um, I'm a member of Niles Rotary Club. And today we're very honored to have um, Rick, Richard D. King, Rick King, uh, former Rotary International President of the year 2001-2002, here with us. And the purpose of our, our interview today is to capture some of the stories and the experiences uh, for new members about what Rick has experienced in his time in Rotary. And he invited me to join the Niles Rotary Club. I've been in the Rotary Club for nine years, and it's honestly changed my life the way I view things, and it's given me the opportunity to serve others and find happiness in doing so. Um, Rick, you, you joined Rotary uh, some time ago, and um, you had an experience. I believe there was some story about Italy or, or something like that. Can you tell us about that? I joined Rotary in 1968. I didn't want to join. I was too busy. I was singing three shows a night in Las Vegas, and I was suing people, <laughs> and I was enjoying both occupations. But an educator came to my office and asked me if I would like to visit the Rotary Club, named Paul Errett, and I really liked him. I admired him, and he was a wonderful man and a good friend. So I joined, and I remember the president of the club said, we know you're busy, if you can just get once here once every three months, we'll give you a perfect attendance bin at the end of the year. <laughs> I thought, well, I can handle that. Not long thereafter, I was going to Rome to do a television taping. And when I got to Rome, nothing was right. They had given my room away. I had no place to stay. And I'm driving in a taxi down the Via Veneto, and I pass a grand hotel, and it says the Rotary Club of Rome meets here today. And I thought, I think I belong to that. So I'm going in to make out. In those days, in my early 20s, I got those terms make out and make up mixed up all the time. But I thought I might as well learn how to do that at a Rotary Club. So I walked in and here were several hundred aging, distinguished, white-haired, patrician, all men of course in those days. And I sat down next to an aging, white-haired, patrician, Roman, banker, Rotarian. And I'm wearing my orange and brown plaid sport coat that I still bought in Las Vegas. And he said to me, I see you're an American. And I thought, boy, he's smart. He knew that well, I hadn't said anything. And I said, yes, I'm from California. And he said, I knew that. So I sat down and we became friends. And I told him my tale of woe that I was looking for a place to stay. And the long and the short of it is that he took me to a hotel after the meeting and I had a lovely suite of rooms, and I had a beautiful young Italian woman who was my guide. She was physically fit, long block, black hair, almond-shaped eyes, olive complexion. I don't remember all the details about her, but I remember a few. And she was my guide over three or four days, and we dined where Caesar dined, and we rode the Appian Way. We had an audience with the Pope. It was a great experience. When I went to check out of my box, of my hotel, there was a note in my box, and it said, no charge, happy to be of service to a Rotarian from so many miles away from home, ciao, which in those days I thought was dinner. And uh, on the way back on the plane, flying back across the ocean to my home here in California, I couldn't figure out why he had done that. I couldn't figure out he was an old man, I was very young. He had obviously a lot of money, I had none. He, he just did this out of the kindness of his heart. And I thought, I've learned something about the kind of person that Rotary creates, or the kind of person who's in Rotary. And I said to myself, someday I want to be like that man who does something for somebody without any expectation of return. At our international convention in Rome in 19... 79, I think it was, I went, and I went to look him up, but he had already passed away. But I've never forgotten him. 
and it was my first of many experiences in Rotary teaching me why I am a Rotarian. It was just a few years later that the district governor called me up and said, I want you to lead a group study exchange team to India. I didn't even know where India was. And I said, Governor, I want to go to Honolulu, not India. <laughs> but he said, I want you to go to India. So off I went to India with five young Californians. We were all about the same age, really, because I wasn't very much older than they were. And I had an experience there that changed my life. I had a lot of experiences in India on that trip and on a dozen since then that have changed my life. But this one I'll never forget. The president of the Rotary Club was a physician. And he took me into a cow dung hut in a village, in a very poor village. And the floor of the village of the hut was dirt. And there was no roof on the hut. It was the sky of earth. And the walls were made of cow dung. And uh, he knelt down beside me in front of a young woman whose head was all bandaged. And he had just operated on her with tools provided by the Rotary Foundation. And he had done a cataract surgery, which in this country is done in an hour. But over there in those days, 30, 40 years ago, it was a big deal. And this was the moment where they were going to see whether the site had been restored. I sat down next to the doctor, facing the woman, next to a cow. The cow was very sacred and was there in the cow dung hut. Behind me were two young Indian children with matted hair, smudged white robes, and they were staring at this woman. And I concluded that they must be her children. The president of the club, the doctor, very gently began to unravel the bandages from this woman's head. And you could hear a pin drop. And in a moment she opened her eyes. And for the first time in her life, she saw her own three children. I'll never forget the look on her face. I'll never forget it. It seared me. She wasn't the only one who got vision that day. I crawled out of that cow dung hut with a vision of what Rotary can do, not only for others, not only for this woman and her children, but what it did to me, being a participant. It changed my whole perspective on what it was all about, this Rotary organization. So many think that it's just a place where we go and have lunch and have a few laughs. But really, it changes people. It makes them better citizens, not only where they live, but in the global community as well. And I have lots of experiences like that. Wow, that's, that's amazing. I know that as I've, I've joined the club, um, the thing that's kept me coming have, have been the ability to hear some of the experiences that you've had. And being the International Rotary President, getting to see how the money's spent and how people are being helped. Well, in Rotary, I often am fond of saying that it's, it's an extension of my faith. It's God's work on earth because we help people regardless of their religion, regardless of their politics, regardless of their color, regardless of their language. Every second of the day, we make the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. We clothe the naked. We feed the hungry, we heal the sick, we save lives, we bring hope, and we bring peace. And that's the thrust of Rotary. And in so doing, the Rotarian becomes a changed person, a much better human being. And I understand that a few years ago, you have a, a dear friend um, who started uh, an organization called the Wheelchair Foundation. 
And can you share a little bit about um, your involvement with that? And I believe there's a story um, involved where you were able to deliver. Oh, that. lots of stories. I've been on many wheelchair distributions. Uh, Ken Baring in Blackhawk created the Wheelchair Foundation. He has a big plane and he often flies things that are needed in some community around the world to help out in a humanitarian way. And as he tells the story, he was asked to go to Salt Lake City to pick up some foodstuffs from the LDS humanitarian arm and take them to Eastern Europe. And as they were doing that, there were some used wheelchairs being loaded on the plane. And they got to, I think it was Serbia, and he saw these people lined up who needed a wheelchair who didn't have one. And he called his friend, as I understand the story, from Kofi Annan, the General Secretary of the United Nations, and said, how many people in the world need a wheelchair that can't afford one? And the response came back, probably 150 million or 300 million, it was some such number. And Ken Baring, in his usual optimistic way, said, well, I can do that. He had the funds, the resources to do it. What he didn't have was the manpower. So he came to us at Rotary, to my predecessor, Frank Devlin, from Mexico City, and to me, and asked if Rotary would partner with him and we agreed that we would. And uh, Rotarians have been on wheelchair distributions all over the world. And now we've distributed more than a million wheelchairs across the globe. It's quite an experience. And every time I've picked somebody up and put them in a wheelchair, I'm reminded that it's a blessing to have legs that work and arms that work and a body that functions. And as usual, the service has done more for me than it has done for the people we put in the wheelchair. The story you made reference to was one in Shanghai. I remember another one in New Jersey, in our own country, where we took a little girl, six years of age, born with spina bifida, from her father's arms and put her in a new red wheelchair. And I was supposed to give a speech. And uh, this girl started to wheel herself in a wheelchair up and down the center aisle in the room. There were about 400 people in the room, 200 on this side, 200 over here on this side. And she was oblivious to the fact that almost every eye in the room was looking at her. And she began to wheel herself up and down the center aisle, having the time of her life. I put my speech back in my pocket because I thought nobody needs the speech now. That's the speech is right there in front of us. When it was all done, her father, a short Mexican man with tears streaming down his cheeks, came up to me and he said, Mr. King, thank you for this gift. Every time I carried her into a school playground, my heart broke because I knew that she couldn't understand why she couldn't get down and play soccer or kick the ball or run the way her two little brothers did who were there that day also with their mother and father. And so now she will be able to get down in her wheelchair and kick the ball and play with them. So you've given a gift to not only my little girl but to me, to her mother and to her brothers. So we thank you. And I said, don't thank me. I have two artificial hips in me and an artificial knee. I've applied for an artificial brain, but I don't need a wheelchair. At least I've never needed a wheelchair. So I said to this young father, I don't need a wheelchair, so I really don't understand the gift we gave to your little girl today. But I will always remember the gift she gave to me. And the reason I do what I do in Rotary is because I'm selfish. 
I always get more than the person we're helping. I remember when I first joined this club. As I remember it, and I was new in the club, so I don't remember all the details, but it seems to me that the club sponsored a Boy Scout troop. And the boys in this troop were either blind or deaf or both because of the School for the Blind and Deaf right here in Fremont. And from time to time, we'd bring these boys to the Niles Rotary Club meeting. And they would participate in the meeting with us. And I remember one day, I've told this story all over the world, sitting having my lunch, I arrived late, and I sat down with a fellow lawyer and two boys from the scout troop. One of them was obviously blind. And when he tried to put his spoon into the plate of food, he couldn't get it to his mouth without it spilling. And I watched this for a moment, and I saw my fellow lawyer, my fellow Rotarian, put his knife and fork down on his own plate, put his arm around the back of this blind Boy Scout, and gently help him lift his spoon to his mouth so that he could eat his lunch, letting his own lunch get cold, of course. And I watched that for five minutes. And I thought to myself, who here is the beneficiary the most? The blind Boy Scout? The Rotarian who helped him? Or me? who was getting to watch. All three of us benefited from this gesture. And I've got a book full of them. Yeah. And I'm really glad that we have an opportunity to hear some of your stories and hear some of the things and experiences you've had. You've had amazing experiences. Um, one of the things that we know is dear to your heart um, is a speech. We have a speech contest, and they've named it the Richard D. King Speech Contest. and can you tell us why it's important that we have the youth getting the opportunity to express acts of Rotarian service in these speeches? And why is it important for them to have that experience of speaking to groups of people? I learned a long time ago that the singular most important characteristic that people are judged by, first and foremost, is their voice their ability to speak. People judge other people quickly by their ability to communicate, more so than their language, their color, their religion, their profession, their education, their looks, their size, their height, their weight, their voice, their ability to speak. And I knew as a young man I wanted to be a lawyer, so I thought, I've got to learn how to speak. My father was an office machine salesman, and he didn't know anything about speech per se, so I knew I was going to have to pick this up the best I could. I was taking swimming lessons at the downtown Oakland YMCA, free, because we couldn't afford anything else, and I was 11 years old. And I was swimming down there one day, and I heard a man come to the swimming coach and said, we're sponsoring a speech contest for boys. And the first prize is a $1,000 college scholarship. This was back 65 years ago. That was a lot of money. So I jumped out of the pool, dripping wet, stark naked, and said, I'll enter. I didn't even know what a speech was. The speech contest was sponsored by the Downtown Oakland Optimist Club, one of the great service clubs in this country. And as is always the case in service clubs like Rotary or Kiwanis or Lions or Optimist, my coach was not a professional speech person. He was just a member of the Downtown Club assigned to help me prepare for the speech contest, as were all the other contestants. My coach, Norman Dan Anker, was a funeral director. He went 
took me to the Oakland Library and we wrote my speech. You couldn't have any notes in this particular contest. There was no microphone in this particular contest. So he put me into his funeral parlor. And he stood in one corner and he put me in the other corner. And in the middle were caskets. People lying in their caskets waiting to be buried. And he said to me, Rick, I want this speech to raise the dead. <laughs> I'm 11 years old. I'd never seen a dead person until then. And I thought to myself, if it does, I'm out of here in a hurry. But he coached me. And I went back to Detroit, Michigan, to the International Convention of the Optimist Club that year. The guy who won the first prize, who got the $1,000, was 16 years age, which was the high level. My voice hadn't even changed yet. But I got third prize, which was $500. And then I realized that I could enter other speech contests. So by the time, four years later, I entered Cal when I was 16, I had lots of money lined up from having won speech contests. So I decided years later, when I became the district governor of Rotary in this district, that we ought to initiate a speech contest for young people, boys and girls, so they can learn how to communicate. And I believe it's important. You see, when a person enters a speech contest, and they're a high school student, it takes a lot of courage. Because unlike on an athletic team, you can always, where you can always toss the ball to somebody else, even Stephen Curry tosses the ball to somebody else once in a while. You have a team there to back you up, but not when you're in a speech contest. It's you, you alone. Your guts and your courage and your work stands up there all by itself. And you have to stand there for five minutes or whatever it is to the contest and deliver your message and hope that it's well received. It takes courage, but it's paid off for me. I've given speeches all over the world many, many times to all kinds of audiences in well over a hundred countries, every state in the country, every province in Canada. And I got it, I think, from when I was a young boy learning my first steps in how to do a speech. It certainly paid off as a lawyer. So I think it's important that we teach these young people, and of all the things in Rotary, I'm very proud of that fact that that speech contest exists in our district. And I enjoy it. I've really enjoyed it as well. I, um, I remember when I first joined the club and I was able to hear the uh, high school students speak, I was shocked at the quality and the presentation, them being so young to speak in front of a group of people they don't know, business yeah. leaders, and they do an amazing job. One thing I remember um, from one of, your, uh, one of your speeches is that during your year as uh, president of Rotary International, um, there was a newspaper article, I think in New York, one of the prominent papers published the 100 most influential people. And I think, I think you were 26 or 27th on the list. And I don't remember exactly where I was on the list, but I was shocked to see that somebody brought it into my office when I was yeah. president of RI. I believe it was the Wall Street Journal, but I, okay. I'm not sure. Okay. And it talked about, since then I've studied leadership a lot, and of course I'd studied it before. And the single most important word that I associate with leadership is influence. Does one have influence? The ability to influence people to do something, often that they don't want to do. That, to my judgment, is real leadership. If one has the ability to influence people to a course of action. So I believe that that New Zealand paper article was accurate because I believe that Rotary influences people to do things. We don't just talk, we get things done. Look at all the projects in our own club mm -hmm. that are constantly being done. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I know that when I first joined uh, Rotary, I actually I went through a little bit of a hard time. My son, as you well know, as, yes. a, as a friend, has had some surgeries and some hard times. and. Um, Hearing that the Paul Harris Award, uh, when, when a member donates uh, $1,000 towards the Rotary Foundation, um, they receive a Paul Harris pin, and, and we're proud to wear these. And Rick has shared several times that when you donate $1,000 to the Rotary Foundation, you're in actuality saving four lives. I got that from a dear friend of mine. One of the real benefits of Rotary 
is that the people you meet who influence you over the years, and I've had so many of them, starting with that old man in Rome and the man who invited me to join Rotary. But I was sitting in the back of a taxi in Evanston, Illinois, at Rotary World Headquarters, with my friend Mike Pedrick from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mike was a powerful man, six foot four, I don't know, 300 pounds, made a lot of money in oil in Oklahoma and dog food, two disparate industries, and he was successful in both. And uh, he was a mentor of mine and a great friend. I stayed in his home in Tulsa many times over the years. And we were talking about the Rotary Foundation. And Mike Pedrick, who in his 30s was a Paul Harris Fellow and a director of Rotary International, said to me, you know, Rick, every time we get somebody to become a Paul Harris Fellow, we save four lives. We've shown how that happens. And I don't remember how he went on to explain it, but I've never forgotten the statistic. I've always thought it saves five. It saves the Rotarian as well, because they become more committed to what it is. And when you separate a little of your money, one of my favorite experiences is a past district governor friend of mine who has since passed away down in Orange County. And he asked me to come down and speak at his club at a Thursday noon. So I had to miss our own club meeting, of course. And I flew down to John Wayne Airport and he picked me up in his big black car. And I could tell that he wasn't his usual self. Well, my wife and I had a somber experience this morning, Rick, with our daughter and her new husband. We went to the children's wing of the county hospital and we brought home our very first grandchild. And I congratulated him and I said, well, that's wonderful. Well, it was because she was born 10 days ago, he said, on a Sunday. And the doctors told us that she probably wouldn't live. We couldn't see her for a week. And he said, my daughter cried the whole week, the, the child's mother. My wife cried, the child's grandmother. The young husband had no idea how to console his wife. And last Sunday, one week after the birth, and three or four days before I got there, the doctor called and said, you can come for just a few seconds today. We think we've elevated her to 50-50. You know, he said, Rick, when you go to a children's wing of a county hospital to see a sick child, and it's your own child, it's not much fun. You know that. So they took us into a room with one patient about this big, laying there on a bed, hooked up to a big machine with tubes and wires. You know how they do. And Carol and I put our arms around each other and we wept. We prayed. I wanted to do something to help this little baby live. And then he says, I got the shock of my life. Because there in the corner of the machine was the rotary wheel. And I rubbed my eyes and underneath it there was a little plaque and it said, this machine was donated by the Rotarians of the Rotary Club of Orange. My club, he said. My mind raced back three years earlier when the president of the club stood up and said the children's wing needs a new machine. It's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost a million dollars. But we are Rotarians and I think we can do it. So he said, I thought I should set an example because I'm a past district governor. I've been in Rotary 30 years, and so I wrote a check. Because you know, Rick, Rotary's always asking for a little of our money. And he said, I sold beer and hot dogs at the club fundraiser at the county fair. Because you know, Rick, Rotary's always asking for a little of our time. And I forgot all about it. I've been in Rotary 30 years. How many projects? How many checks? How many hot dogs? 30 years. I forgot all about it. Until last Sunday. When that machine was keeping my first grandchild 
alive. And he began to cry. And I began to cry. It's hard to describe what each of us felt. A little time and a little money. And he looked at me and he said, Rick, how did we ever get so lucky to belong to a club that's always asking us to give a little? Because you can't give it away. Sooner or later, one way or another, always and inevitable, it comes back. You can't give it away. So I believe in what we're doing in the Rotary Foundation. And this year, of course, is the 100th anniversary of the Foundation. It's done a lot. And I have so many stories of projects that I've seen the Foundation do over and over and over again. We were in Ethiopia. And the club asked if I would come to a project, and I was very tired. But I went up there, seven hours in a jeep, and we came to a meadow, and they took me to a well, one water well. And there were little boys standing on the other side of the well, their sunken cheeks, sunken eye sockets, sunken stomachs, each holding a little brass cup about this big. And my aide said, Rick, this is the day they get to come to the well. They get to come here every two days, every 48 hours. And they get to fill their cup half full with fresh water. And that's the amount of water they get to drink every two days. He said, we don't save them all. Some die all the time. But we're saving more and more and more, thanks to Rotary. There was a plaque on the side of the well. This well was dug with donations from contributions to Rotarians, to the Rotary Foundation, of Rotary International. But once again, I can't even comprehend what we did for those boys on the other side of the well. I can't comprehend it. But I can tell you that being there once again changed me. Changed me. And I realize that there's more to this life and just suing people, making money. I, I had a successful career in that field, and I enjoyed it. But the only, in my judgment, the only thing we're going to take with us when we leave this life is the humanity we've expressed to others, the way we've applied humanity to our business, the way we've made mankind our business. This is the thing that will go with us as we leave this life. And Rotary has given me the chance to engage this most important business, more important than any other business I've done. I've enjoyed them all, the singing, the speaking, the lawyering. It's all been great. But it's the mankind, the humanity, the business of people that I've enjoyed the most. I know the, the song that we sing in our club, Smile, uh, that's, that's actually, we, we're a singing club, so we sing a lot. And Rick loves to sing. He performed in Vegas. and um, we, um, That song is really special to me because if there's any day where it's hard or things that are difficult that are happening in life, we sing that song and you just smile. You just feel good. You feel like all's right with the world and you're medicine. okay. It's medicine for the soul. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Sure. With um, one couple uh, more questions for you, and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, I'd, I'd love to ask um, Sherry, your wife, you got lucky. You've got this beautiful wife who's a dancer that you met and somehow convinced her to uh, be your companion for life. Can Give you... up a show business career. That's right. <laughs> and follow me around listening to my speeches. Yes. Um, what would you like to share about your beautiful companion? Life is always of more value when you have somebody to share it with. If it's fortunate enough to be a spouse, that's the best. If not, it can be children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, whatever family one has. They are the most important thing. 
I believe that with all my heart and soul. Fortunately, I have a wife who's a strong woman who's loved all over the world of Rotary. She gives speeches in her own right, one of which is a comedy entitled The King and I, about our year together and some of the funny things that happened as we were traveling the world. I honestly believe that Mikhail Gorbachev fell in love with her, as did heads of state all over the world, because Sherry charms them, is intelligent, asks them probing questions, and carries on a conversation with them about their lives and their country that is really unsurpassed. She's beautiful inside and out. Her most important calling in life is grandmother and Sunday school teacher. And that I think she enjoys more than anything that has ever come her way. Even after all the glamorous show business and she danced with some of the greats in Hollywood and all of the luminaries that she's met all over the world, I think that family is the most important thing to her. And because of her, my whole experience at Rotary has been much more rewarding and enriching than it otherwise ever would have been. I love her deeply. She's a great godsend in my life. I'm lucky. You are. And an amazing man at the same time. Well, I want to thank you for your time today and sharing a little bit about your experiences. Um, we wanted to record this and share this with other people and continue to do the work of introducing to potential Rotary members what it means, how it changes your life. Um, I know that because you asked me to come and join Niles Rotary, my life has changed for the better. Um, it was a particularly difficult time. My son was having surgeries. He was in and out of the hospital. Financially, it was difficult at that time with real estate. Um, and I can honestly say it was, it was like a, an oasis in a desert, a place to go and feel a part of the community and to be taught that by doing stuff for other people really brings happiness in your life. So I thank you because you're the person that did that for me. So. I appreciate all you do. Appreciate you and your service to the club. Thank you.